Warm welcome to everyone to SOAS China Institute Monday seminar. My name is Dr. Xiaoning Lu. I'm a reader in modern Chinese culture and language at the SOAS. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Professor Guo Bing Yang. Uh, Dr. Yang is the Grace Lee Box Professor of Communication and Sociology at the Annenberg School for Communication and the De Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, United States. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, he, uh, he also directs the Center on Digital Culture and Society and serves as Deputy Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. Professor Guo Bing Yang studies social movements, digital culture, global communication, and contemporary China. He has published numerous scholarly articles and books. Here, I just want to mention three books that came out with uh, the uh, Columbia University Press. The first one is the award-winning book, The Power of the Internet in China, Citizen Activism Online, which was published in 2009. The second, The Red Guard Generation and the Political Activism in China, which was published in 2012. The last is Professor Yang's latest book, The Wuhan Lockdown, uh, which just came out this year. As we hold this event, there is a new nationwide surge in COVID cases in China. Swift lockdowns, travel restrictions, and mass testing are being enforced in various districts in the city of Jilin, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. So Professor Yang's talk today, echoes of the past during the Wuhan lockdown is particularly timely. I'm sure that you'd like to ask many questions following Professor Yang's talk. I'd like to invite you to type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself so that we understand where the questions are coming from. If you prefer to remain anonymous, please let us know and, and we will respect your wishes. Without further ado, uh, um, I'd like to give the floor to Professor Yang. Thank you, Professor Lu, um, for your very kind um, introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, um, to talk about my book. It's really a great pleasure. And um, I also want to thank everybody for attending. I know it's evening time um, in London. It's about time to, to be off work. To, <laughs> so um, really um, appreciate this opportunity and, um, and the conversations I had. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, briefly introduce the book um, and then um, focus on one particular theme, underlying theme, I would say, echoes of history. Um, so I've been giving a good number of talks about the book. Um, it has uh, you know, a variety of themes and I found that uh, I really couldn't cover everything uh, in one talk. So I've come up with a strategy of uh, giving some um, broad introduction to the book and then uh, focusing on one particular theme um, at one, you know, on one particular occasion. So today is the echoes of history. Um, I thought one way of introducing the book um, is to share the result of a test I took not long ago. Um, and the test is called Page 99 test is one of the websites. Page 99 test is a website associated with Campaign for the American Reader, which is a campaign to promote the culture of book reading. And it has been around for a long time. It introduces uh, new books and the editor invites um, authors to basically apply this page 99 test to their book. And the idea of the test is borrowed from um, a sentence, a statement attributed to the British novelist, Ford Maddox Ford. And the statement is this, open the book to page 99 and read and the quality of the whole 
will be revealed to you. So when the editor of the website asked me to apply the test to my book, I accepted the invitation uh, at the risk of failing it. Um, but I, I do think that page 99 of the Wuhan lockdown shows quite well a few features of the book. Um, so what I'm going to do is to read my response to the test, basically my exam, my exam paper in response to the test. And this is published on the website, page 99 test. It's only a few paragraphs. Page 99 of the Wuhan lockdown is in the middle of telling the story of Anie, a 26 year old professional who worked in Beijing. She had traveled back to her hometown Wuhan to spend the Lunar New Year with her family. Back home, she caught COVID and was hospitalized in a temporary shelter hospital. Her 89-year-old grandmother, who also had COVID, was in another hospital for patients with severe symptoms only. When her grandma was put in ICU care, Anian requested to be relocated to her grandma's hospital so she could look after her. Her request was granted and she joined her grandma. Anian posted diary entries on social media every day in which she provided updates about her grandma's condition as well as descriptions of life in the hospital. Sadly, her grandma died on March the 6th, 2020. Anian had promised her mother that she would go home together with grandma. Now, she wrote, I did not finish my job. Page 99 captures several key features of the book. The Wuhan lockdown is not a conventional academic book. It experiments with a new approach of storytelling, one that focuses on the presentation of scenes and characters. Very much a book of characters, it tells the stories of a galaxy of individuals in Wuhan in their daily struggle to cope with the COVID pandemic. Some stories take up several pages. Others are as brief as just one sentence. The story of Anian is one of the longer character portraits and probably one of the most memorable. Although the character por portraits in the book cover both men and women, there are more stories of women than men. Women played a prominent role in the lockdown as healthcare workers, caregivers, volunteers, and activists. Other notable women characters in the book include a gong beating woman, a swearing auntie, several feminist activists, Dr. Ai Fen, who is the was colleague of Dr. Li Wenliang who died of COVID, Fang Fang, the artist, and so forth. And I'm very pleased to have a woman's story on page 99. Finally, Anian's story highlights another notable feature of the Wuhan lockdown, the use of online pandemic diaries to construct my account. Anian wrote two diaries during the, during the pandemic. One posted on social media, the other published in print. I made use of both. Indeed, although I used many different types of materials in writing the book, online diaries are the main primary sources. I cited at least 46 diarists in the book and read and consulted numerous others. Diaries are the ideal documents for understanding the visceral feelings, thoughts, and activities of residents caught in their daily struggle. I'm very glad that page 99 contains several direct diary quotations, which convey the voice of one of the characters in the book. 
So that's a few paragraphs I wrote in response to that test, um, page 99. I thought the test shows three things, um, that the book is about storytelling. Um, it is about the stories of ordinary men and women in Wuhan. And it is primarily based on lockdown diaries. So uh, in that sense, page 99, um, sort of showcases uh, some of the main features of the book quite well. Uh, let me explain a little bit uh, why um, I chose to focus on storytelling instead of say, let's say, um, develop a theory or some concepts um, to explain um, what was happening in Wuhan. Um, I think one main motivation for me uh, was to document a major historical event from bottom-up, bottom-up perspective. Um, and I started uh, working on this project uh, almost as soon as the lockdown started, because um, you know, when it started, I wanted to understand uh, what this might mean for, not only for Wuhan, but for people in China. And I have families, my wife and I, we both have families in China. Um, and I wanted to read about um, SARS 2003, which was, you know, um, quite a while ago, but uh, also a major crisis at that time. Um, hospital, there, there were hospitals in Beijing which were locked down in 2003. Um, but I didn't find a lot of material. There were, uh, there were some, um, but not, uh, not as much as I wanted. Um, um, so you know, uh, as soon as this, uh, this crisis started, I thought what I could do is try to collect all these very rich material, um, personal writing of all varieties, uh, which was appearing uh, in large quantities every day. And that was one different from 2003. 2003, the internet, social media, you know, not as developed, um, was important, of course, at that time. But this time, um, the, the amount of personal writing was just um, unbelievably rich, you know. Um, so I collected these documents, I read them, I followed them closely. And um, it was also a way for me to um, follow what was happening um, in other parts of China um, because we were worried about our uh, relatives uh, in other, in Beijing or in other cities. And we have friends in Wuhan. Um, but most importantly, uh, you know, as a sociologist uh, who, who have really have uh, being uh, very much in, sort of uh, really interested in studying this kind of personal documents. Um, Professor Lu mentioned my earlier books uh, in both books, the internet book and the um, Red God book, I made use of um, personal writing uh, of uh, you know, various kinds of personal writing, diaries um, from the Cultural Revolution, letters as well. So these kind of, uh, as soon as they appeared on social media after the Wuhan, after Wuhan lot, I realized this was just a wealth of material and um, you know, it's very precious for social science, uh, for scholarly research. So that's, uh, that's one motivation. I wanted to document uh, a major historical event and you know, trying to provide bottom-up perspective in a sense that I, I'm going to, I was going to make use of mainly diaries and other kind of personal writings, photographs, uh, poems, and so on. There are, of course, even from the very beginning, official narratives, and those are useful. I follow the news, uh, you know, the press reports, uh, news releases in Wuhan very closely as well, but mostly I wanted to provide a bottom-up um, story about what was happening in Wuhan. Um, the other reason, or I should say uh, the second reason was, um, you know, um, after, 
here in the US, uh, I suppose in Europe as well, um, media began to co cover the Wuhan lockdown uh, also very quickly. And there were some wonderful stories. Um, I remember um, here um, reports filed from, um, from uh, you know, um, international um, press um, journalists who were based uh, in, in China who traveled to Wuhan. Uh, so some wonderful stories, mostly though, I felt that the mainstream uh, discourse about Wuhan and China, especially um, after March, after we um, in Philadelphia, we began our own lockdown in mid-March. After, after that period of time, there was, a mo there was a period when there was a sort of rise of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese discourse. Uh, um, partly fanned by uh, some political leaders, right? And so all this language about China um, virus, uh, Kung flu, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, in that process, I felt that the voices of ordinary people from Wuhan are missing from these mainstream stories. And I, I felt that, you know, it's necessary to uh, to highlight these voices, to give visibility to stories of these ordinary people. So that's another motivation. I suppose it was an effort to contribute to public discourse about what was happening in Wuhan and in China. Um, and a third reason, I guess, why I focused on storytelling instead of the sort of more uh, analytical um, or theoretical academic approach was because the event was still unfolding when I started writing. Um, it was still very uncertain. The prospect was uncertain. Nobody knew when even the Wuhan lockdown was going to be lifted. Um, uh, so, you know, I felt that uh, as an ethical approach, to an unfolding story, um, I should take a, a humbler approach, uh, trying to avoid, um, I try to avoid um, developing sort of any overarching theories or concepts, or even giving too many explanations and, or drawing too big, you know, sweeping conclusions. Stories, I think stories are there let the stories uh, speak for themselves. Um, I did try to offer some interpretations and trying to provide a lot of context to these stories. But mostly I try to avoid um, theorizing um, and focus instead on telling the stories. Um, I did use a few concepts. I mentioned scenes and characters and context. I talked a little bit about why I wanted to focus, you know, try, try to present scenes from Wuhan. Um, scenes, the concept of scene is borrowed from drama, um, obviously, but it's also used by sociologists, social scientists. A scene is just a, you know, a very brief event that crystallizes many things, right? Um, we may, uh, we may argue that scenes, behind scenes, we can trace institutional or other structural factors, but mostly I think um, scholars who have analyzed scenes like scenes, music scenes, urban scenes, scenes in social movements have uh, been uh, attracted to this concept because it, um, um, it it provides room for, for contingency. Uh, scenes are dynamic, but they are in, in many ways are also unpredictable. Um, so in, in this sense, I sort of this provides so somewhat uh, of a non-reductionist um, theoretical op, uh, orientation to the, um, to the presentation of the stories from Wuhan. Um, I think um, an example is probably um, necessary at this point. Um, let me let me give give one example just to uh, 
to illustrate uh, what a scene is like that you know, I present scenes and characters and why um, uh, this concept um, seems to be to me a useful way of, um, of constructing the stories. So every chapter really consists of a lot of scenes and characters. And let me, uh, let me just uh, uh, choose one example from chapter three which is uh, called People's Wall. And I'll come back to, to chapter three, People's Wall, because when I come to talk about echoes of history. So many, many dramatic stories in this chapter, and one of which is, uh, is called Fake, Fake. Uh, that's the title of that uh, short section. Um, and the story was really pretty brief. Uh, Sun Chunlan, vice premier, who, uh, recently is in news again because of the resurgence of, uh, of uh, COVID in China. But she was the number one um, person on the ground, uh, basically directing the so-called the, the people's war on COVID. Um, so on March the 5th, 2020, she was leading a group of um, Wuhan, Hubei, um, you know, local Cadres on a tour of a residential communi community. So early March and late February was a particularly um, stressful pe period for a lot of the residents in, in Wuhan, because uh, at that time, Wuhan, the lockdown, you know, I, I didn't get to talk about exactly the Wuhan lockdown was like. It was, it was you know, nothing like the kind of lockdown we had here. In, in Philadelphia, right? Um, we could go out anytime we wanted to uh, here, of course, but in Wuhan, it was, it was complete sealing off of the residential communities, um, which uh, of course meant uh, that uh, daily life uh, would become very difficult for the residents. And part, one of the critical things was uh, grocery shopping, grocery shopping. Was, uh, was, was challenging for, uh, for a period of time because you couldn't go out. Every family could have one member um, going out, checking out of their community every three days. Um, so uh, the community volunteers were supposed to be responsible for delivering groceries and uh, you know, residents were organizing themselves using WeChat to do uh, group shopping. And that's how um, they managed most, most people. But there were occasional occasional issues, you know, you know um, and uh, some residents were angry. So this incident on March the fifth happened when um, Premier Sun Chunlan uh, was touring the residential community, and while she and um, other cadres were walking in the community, uh, residents from the the buildings uh, high up, you know, windows began to shout "fake and fake." Um, uh, 假的, 假的. Um, and what we were, they were talking about was that the, the residential community, knowing that uh, leaders, these party leaders were coming to inspect um, today, they prearranged for free uh, groceries to be delivered to the residents. So it was really for sure, right, to impress leaders. But at this point, um, uh, the voices came just came out of the windows from these buildings to to you know people were really angry and uh, and um, and this uh, this very very brief period really um, were recorded and people posted on social media and became viral so it became one of the one of the better known um, one of I, I suppose one of the um, best known instance or scenes of the lockdown period. So it was a very brief period. And what, what happened next was that uh, Vice Premier Sun immediately convened the meeting uh, of these cadres and uh, um, uh, very seriously uh, told everybody that, you know, we got to hear, uh, got to listen to the complaints of the residents. Uh, this is a serious matter. We've got to solve their problem. So you know they 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 moved very quickly to try to resolve the issue. So that was 
the story of fake and fake incident. So uh, it was a scene in the sense that this was very brief and, but also in the sense uh, when I say that this is a non-reductionist uh, kind of, if, if, what does this thing tell us about politics, COVID politics in the Wuhan lockdown period, or maybe even about Chinese politics um, more generally? I think uh, we can certainly invoke um, uh, theories of institutions, uh, party structures, um, so state society relations, all these, you know, um, familiar concepts and theories in China studies to understand um, this thing and, and this will be very useful. But uh, I will also argue that, um, that this particular thing of fake and fake could only happen at that moment in that particular place. Was it going to be repeated? We don't know. You know, um, there was a lot of contingency. People were really angry at that mo at that very moment. There were there were si several similar incidents at that time. So I think uh, uh, my approach in presenting this story was really trying to uh, tell the story, right? Describe the story, and try not to offer any theory or try to you know draw a big conclusion uh, just based on this one thing. Uh, so that's one example. And like I said, the book, uh, every chapter has many such things. And each chapter, I would say, of course, there are a number of key themes and uh, conclusions can be drawn. But uh, by the end of the book, even though the book has a conclusion, um, I deliberately try to avoid uh, drawing a big conclusion about what's the meaning of the Wuhan lockdown, right? I think all these stories add up to, uh, to you know, really sort of uh, have, create, create a very rich picture of the experiences of the Wuhan lockdown. But how can, can we turn, sort of summarize this in one sentence or one theory, uh, one um, proposition? Maybe, but I try not to. Um, and I, my hope was that uh, readers will draw uh, their own um, conclusions. So uh, I think that's uh, what I'm going to say about uh, why I focused on storytelling and what I tried to do in this book um, as an introduction to, to the general sort of uh, structure, design and content of the book. I'll be happy to to go into uh, any particular chapter to, to share more of the stories um, in, in various chapters um, later on at, you know, during the Q&A. But uh, let me move to, to the theme I wanted to focus on today at this point, because um, I'm uh, check, seeing the time, not much time left. So echoes of history, I don't have a chapter that is called Echoes of History in the book. Um, but this is a theme that runs through um, many chapters, but at least three chapters where we have, you know, we can see a very clear uh, underlying theme of these echoes of history. And um, I will I will share stories from those uh, three chapters later on. But let me, before that, let me briefly explain what I mean by echoes of history. Um, very broadly, I, you know, I think of three main types of echoes, historical echoes um, or historical references and memories. The first type is, uh, we can think of them as vocabularies and idioms with very strong historical or cultural resonances. Um, if we look at the, not just personal stories from the time, diaries and so on, but, but are certainly from official discourse as well. Uh, there are a lot of familiar um, vocabularies. People's War is the obvious example, Renmin Zhan Zheng, um, from, from, you know, made famous by Lin Biao in his, um, 
in his long treatise uh, in, uh, in memory of the 20th anniversary of the victory of the uh, China's war of resistance against Japan. Um, long live people's war, long live the victory of the people's war. And of course, during the Cultural Revolution, um, the Red Guard factions uh, fighting against one another, they were all invoking this concept of people's war. Uh, and many other similar concepts, Bao Wei Zhan, right? Um, Chu Zheng, uh, boy, the battle of defense, um, Xu Yuan Shi oath taking, um, Chu Zheng, right, going on expedition, setting off, uh, because uh, again, remember that uh, in the, especially in the early period of lockdown, um, medical teams were being dispatched from uh, various parts of the country to Wuhan. And um, all, almost all of them, you know, before they, before they set off on their journey, uh, either flying or by taking the train, it was common for them to have an oath taking ceremony. It was oath taking ceremony. And, you know, it was uh, moving, a lot of moving scenes of that kind. Familiar language, um, Song Wenshen by Mao, Mao's poems, Farewell to the God of Plague, was uh, often uh, was often invoked in a lot of the online stories. Mei you know, uh, so that's one category of this kind of uh, echoes of history. There is there is a whole network of vocabularies and idioms which invoke the idea of war, battle, um, and uh, militancy. Um, and that's an uh, important part of that uh, cultural social discourse at the time. The second category, roughly, I think of them as uh, contemporary practices, practices during the Wuhan lockdown period, which were reminiscent, reminiscent of past experiences or past histories. Um, you know, some of these examples I gave already uh, fall, fall uh, under this category because oath taking um, was, oath taking is not not new thing during the Wuhan lockdown. It, you know, uh, I think China over the past uh, several decades, um, there has developed a, a whole a repertoire of language and forms of action. Uh, for crisis management during emergencies and crisis. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the Sichuan earthquakes, 2008. Um, actually, uh, certainly back from the SARS period, we can, we can uh, go back to the SARS period. During the SARS period, there was a, a song um, called uh, Dong Zhi Cheng Cheng. Uh, a group of celebrities singing a song of Dong Zhi Cheng Cheng, United We Stand, something like that, right? Which has almost became an anthem of crisis and in, invoked again and again. That was being that uh, particular song and similar other examples were, were being repeated, you know, uh, again during the Wuhan lockdown. There was a revival of loudspeakers. Loudspeakers, uh, we all know, was a ubiquitous uh, presence during the Mao period, uh, you know, in urban and rural areas. And uh, they disappeared for a long time after the reform started because, you know, there were new the radios uh, and televisions and so on. But um, in the past decade, actually, um, the propaganda department um, in China has uh, quite... Uh, 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 consciously being reviving this uh, uh, culture of loudspeakers as a form of propaganda, as a, you know, a media for propaganda. And it was revived uh, very quickly uh, during the Wuhan lockdown and used, um, used uh, both in the cities and, uh, and in rural areas. And some of the diarists wrote about their impressions of this and you know people would mention well this sounds like cultural revolution period so present practice is reminiscent of the past that that will be one example 
uh, community control as well, the community control that uh, we're seeing in China today uh, from the Wuhan lockdown, but up to now, uh, is very, uh, very well organized. Um, it's volunteers, but also consisting of uh, residential community, uh, community uh, committees, uh, party-led committees, um, um, as well as Wu um, Ye, is uh, property management uh, uh, committees, you know, for the, for these residents. There is a whole network of community governance that has been uh, sort of uh, uh, take, taking on some new form, but certainly also reminiscent of the kind of uh, community control from the Cultural Revolution period. I'll read one, one story later on when I come to the stories. So this would be the second kind of echoes of history, present practices that uh, are reminiscent of the past, that are legacies of the past or have you know, continuity with, with the past. The third category, I will call them historical references and memories in, in, in very broadly, but there are two, three kinds, three, three varieties here. One is uh, memories of pride, memories of, uh, you know, proud moments of, of, of the past historical events. And uh, we mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the concept of Renmin Zhandong People's War, invoking that language, you know, is, is part of that language of victory, of war against, uh, of resistance against Japan. But because this was Wuhan lockdown, the Battle of Wuhan in 1938, Wuhan Baoyi was also invoked quite often. It was memories of pride. Uh, except that, of course, the Battle of Wuhan in 1938 was, uh, you know, main, the main character, nationalist army, uh, was rarely mentioned. Uh, but it was still mentioned as a moment of glory, that uh, it was a major battle that thought it, um, uh, it was, you know, uh, Japanese uh, uh, invasion, you know, was a turning point in a sense uh, in a war. So those were uh, earlier moments of uh, pride, uh, historical events that are moments of pride. More recent ones, I mentioned uh, SARS. I also mentioned the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. These are, are also uh, mentioned quite often. You know, the song Woman Zhong Zhi Cheng Cheng from SARS from 2003. Um, was, you know, if you search it, it's everywhere. And it's, it's kind of, you know, a moment of, of pride again, memories of pride when, you know, we, 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 we overcame SARS. We, we managed to, you know, recover very quickly after the Sichuan earthquake. Let's do the same, right? So these uh, memories of pride. The second uh, uh, type here, um, uh, I call the memories of shame. Um, and they go further back, especially to the Boxers' Rebellion, the, you know, the crushing of the Boxers' Rebellion, the burning of the Summer Palace in 1900, uh, and then the Eight Nation Alliance, Ba Guo Lianjun, right? Um, and these, these are uh, historical moments of shame uh, for, for the Chinese nationals. And these came up uh, often too, and I talked about this in the chapter on COVID nationalism, and I, I'll read a few paragraphs from, from them. The third and last uh, category of these kind of historical references and memories are uh, sort of the past as lesson or as negative example. And in this case, it, it's the, the most um, uh, uh, sort of frequently mentioned example, really the Cultural Revolution as a, as a negative, negative example of, of behavior um, in a in, in number of uh, uh, situations. Again, I think I'm, I'm going to mention this, come back to the cultural revolution example later on. So that's the, my, you know, what I mean by the, we, we, from the beginning to the end of the lockdown, all the way to the present, really this people's war on COVID that has been going on for more than 10 years is, uh, uh, really suffused with this uh, vocabulary, this language of war, this, uh, but a lot of them really are echoes of history, it's familiar vocabulary. Um, and they have, I think, 
very powerful effects in mobilizing the public, mobilizing the residents um, in their daily struggle against uh, against you know the COVID. Um, but at the same time, in some cases, there were negative examples. They also attracted critical responses, you know, residents, citizens, critical responses to certain forms of mobilization. Um, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the kind of community control, the very tight community control and surveillance that uh, to some uh, Taoist were reminiscent of, uh, of the Cultural Revolution period. So I, I really don't, I, I think I don't have a lot of time left because I plan is, uh, to have a talk for about 40 or 45 minutes. Let me give, um, when, let me give a couple of examples from the book, um, just to just so we have a sense. Uh, one example is from um, chapter three again. Chapter three uh, again, People's War. Really, uh, I began the chapter by describing the kind of war scenes, warlike scenes uh, after the city was locked down, and I'm not going to read that. But let me read one. Um, couple of paragraphs, two paragraphs, and one of which is an excerpt from a diary uh, to give you a sense of um, uh, echoes of history uh, in Wuhan. Page 48, uh, February 2020 was the month when the war on COVID-19 was at its most austere stage. The strict regimen of community isolation was full of hailing and yelling. On February 8th, Xiao Yin recorded an episode that brought back to him memories of the Cultural Revolution. He wrote that the community where he lived had been sealed off and the entrance was guarded strictly by three people in full protective gear. Just as, as he was going to walk out of the entrance, one of the three guards held him loudly to stop and uh, to stop and have his temperature taken. This reminded Xiao Yin of his childhood experiences. And quote, this is a quote from his diary. When I was small, a kind of cooperative defense and management system was common. We all lived in apartments assigned by work units. There was not enough police force to patrol the community. So a method of people swap was invented. Every household would take turns to take on the responsibility. And every day there would have to be a guard at each building. At the same time, the neighborhood committee organized a group of retired grannies and grandpas to patrol the alleys and the streets, wearing red armbands and carrying a radio. As soon as they spotted anyone idling, they would shout a loud shout, stop, and the person would instantly stop, whether it was a class enemy, an enemy agent, or a petty thief. Uh, I think I'm... Professor uh, Lu, uh, shall I stop here? I think my time is up. I, I'll be happy to share more stories in our Q&A period, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Yang, for sharing those fascinating stories and also for performing storytelling for our audience members.